Hey everyone, welcome to week four of That's What He Said, where we're taking a deep look at the Sermon on the Mount to learn about how what Jesus said back then is impacting us right now. But before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity to get connected. So head to mosaicchristian.org slash groups if you are ready to kick the isolation of 2020, leave it in the past, and get connected in real community. There's a group that fits your schedule and your needs. Head there now and take that step to find your crew. What's up, Mosaic? This is Carl, and my sabbatical has begun. I am so excited for this time of rest, but I did want to introduce today's guest speaker. It is my friend, Scott Nickel. And you may know the name of Scott if you've been around for a while because we've shown a couple videos of his sermons several years ago from when he was a teaching pastor at Flatirons Church in Denver. Since then, he has moved to become uh, the teaching minister at Southland Christian Church back in my home state, of Kentucky. And Scott and I go all the way back to college, and I remember the first time I heard Scott preach. And I hope I'm not overpromising under delivering today. Scott, you better do good. Because when he got up as a 21 year old, he gripped me in a way no other college student ever had in our little Bible college where we had students preach all the time. There was something different about his teaching. I think it comes down to what he has tattooed on his wrist that's grace and truth where every time he preaches, you can't help but feel both of those things. And Scott's so wise when it comes to ministry and family and following Jesus. I, for years, have asked him, Scott, I need you to have like a church conference so I can bring my staff to it. And he's always said, Carl, if we do, we're going to call it, we don't know what the heck we're doing. And I said, great, I'll come. I'll bring my team because we don't either. But I do know he loves his family. I do know he loves Jesus, and he's a great teacher. Now, there's one more thing i got to tell you about Scott, because right now is typically the point where I would say I need us all to put it together and cheer for Scott to welcome him to Mosaic, but he's a University of Kentucky fan, and he does have all his teeth, and he did graduate from fifth grade, but there's something mentally not there. So instead of clapping for him, I need you to boo him and it, it, just eradicate this sin from his life. Welcome Scott Nickel in the meanest, rudest way possible. Thank you. It's a dangerous thing to do that when the person coming up has a microphone attached to their face and you're on the other side of the country. You know, there are certain things, you know that Carl is a, as we say where I'm from, a Louisville fan. He says Louisville because he's from that side of the tracks. And so... <laughs> There are certain realities in life. You cannot be a Red Sox fan and be a Yankees fan. You cannot be a Lakers fan and be a Celtics fan. You cannot be a Louisville fan and be a Christian. And so <laughs> I'm here to tell you, you've been led by a false teacher for many years. <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, I love Carl and I have a few different kinds of heroes uh, in my life and uh, missionaries that are heroes to me and church planters are heroes to me. Uh, I don't have the ministry muscles to do what church planters do. And so uh, Carl is taking a, a well-deserved rest right now. I know you guys are honored to be able to give him that space and give him that time after all these years of labor uh, and love, sweat, and tears poured into this this church and this place and he will come back uh, revived. And so I'm happy to just fill in for one weekend to help that help that happen. Uh, last week, I was at my youngest son's baseball game. And I have had this kind of ongoing argument with my wife over the years about whether uh, cars should be locked or not locked. I am in the camp of there's no reason uh, to lock a car. She locks the car if she's in between unloading groceries. It's maddening. And so uh, we've, had this, <laughs> we've had this ongoing argument and tension in our marriage for over 20 years now. And so I'm at this baseball game. I'm with my daughter and my youngest son. Uh, we unload. I do not lock my car. And we're there for a couple hours. And when we go to, to leave, I notice some things are out of order in the car, which is not necessarily abnormal in my truck. I have four children. I mean, things get out of order, but there's, it's like 85 degrees outside and the, the winter gloves were out on the console. Like something's not right here. And then I realized, oh, somebody's gotten into the console of, of my truck. And on top of that, I had this moment where it was like, and my wallet was in there. And so I go, I go searching, rifling through, I got the kids looking all over. Sure enough, 
uh, the wallet is gone. So the first thing I do is I call a friend of mine who's a police officer. I go, what do I do first? So I call the police first. Do I stop the credit cards first? He's like, definitely stop the credit cards first. Then call, make a police report. But the problem is, like, I don't have the credit cards with, like, the numbers on them, right? And my wife is in another town with another child of mine. I got a bunch of kids. I call them by number. And... Uh, <laughs> So she's with number two, I'm with number one and number four. And so there's a third one in there somewhere too, but not with either of us. In fact, I don't know where he was that day. That's what happens when you have four kids. And so, so I have to call her down in Boyle County and go, hey, I, I, the, the wallet got stolen. Why did it get stolen? Because well, my truck was unlocked. And you left your wallet in it? And Yes, dear, you're right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Now, can we stop payment on the credit cards? And so she... She has some of this stuff on her phone, and so she starts making calls, and I start making calls, and then I make the, the police report. And in that kind of two, two and a half hour time frame, uh, one of my Visa cards uh, was taken by this criminal uh, to, to a, a sporting goods store that went on a, a shopping spree. Now, it could have been worse. Later that day, same parking lot. Uh, somebody uh, stole somebody's F-150. They found that F-150 at a minor league baseball park in our town, uh, abandoned, and also found lots of wallets and checkbooks, including uh, my uh, driver's license and insurance card, which to me was like snatching victory out of the jaws of defeat because this meant that I did not have to go to the DMV. And the, D <laughs> the DMV is a foretaste of hell itself. Now I don't have to go there. The second redemptive feature of me finding my driver's license is that my driver's license is irreplaceable. I live in a little town called Nicholasville, Kentucky, outside of Lexington, Kentucky, and it's a little tiny courthouse. And so when I went, when I moved from Colorado back to Kentucky, I found out my license had been expired. So I had to, actually had to take the driver's written test, which is terrifying when you're 40 years old, by the way. <laughs> I barely passed, and so I got my driver's license, but when I went to go have my picture taken, the lady working there was 920 years old. I kid you not, like Yoda's age, okay? And so she's sitting there, and she, like, she's been taking driver's license pictures since before there were cars, you know? She issued driver's license for your horse, and so she, she's looking at me and just not saying any words, and so some of the words she did not say were things like, remove your hat and look at the camera, I'm about to take your picture. So this is the picture uh, that I ended up on my driver's license. I treasure that. I think it's, I think it's a wonderful likeness of me, all right? In all seriousness, since my wallet was stolen and these things were taken from me, I've been reflecting on, on kind of this question. Uh, what kind of a person or what goes through the mind of somebody who takes from someone else? Says, you know what, there's a truck. Let me see if it's unlocked. Let me see what's in there. Let me take this and let me go spend somebody else's money on their credit cards. What makes somebody go, uh, that F-150 that that guy left running in the parking lot so he could take his kid a baseball bat to the batting cage real fast? Like what went through that person's mind that took it? And the answer, I think, is a simple pattern. I see it, I want it, I take it. And that pattern, interestingly enough, plays itself out in the human heart all the time. It's a pattern that if left unaddressed can actually become very, very habitual. And it's true with more than property, it's true with people. I'll give you a small example. Look at this in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, She's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Now, there's about like 10,000 sermons I could preach on that. But I really just want to focus on that pattern that's playing itself out right here. David saw, he desired, and so he took. It didn't matter that the reason that her house was in such close proximity to the palace was because she just so happened to be the wife of one of his mighty men who had sworn allegiance to not only protecting David with his very life, but actually to further his kingdom and expand his his territory. It doesn't matter that that's what Uriah is actually out on the battlefield doing right now while David's spending his afternoons napping and watching Netflix and drinking beer and eating pizza. It doesn't matter that David is far from being sexually deprived, and we'll talk more about that, but he saw her, he desired her, and so he took her. 
what he thought was a one-time afternoon delight turned into absolute bedlam, turned into absolute chaos. If you know the story, Bathsheba ends up being pregnant. David launches this elaborate cover-up scheme. And when that fails, David resorts to what amounts to the murder of his friend, Uriah. And if you read this story in isolation without the context of David's life, and all you've been aware of is that David's like the good guy, like the guy who went out and and killed the giant, you might be left wondering, like, where did that come from? How could a guy like that end up doing something like that, something so heinous? And the truth is, David was simply doing what he had already been doing for many years. You see, at this point, David had at least seven wives. And if you study his life, you'll see this pattern repeats itself over and over and over again surrounding women. He sees a woman, he desires her, he takes her. He had cultivated and nurtured that pattern over many years. See, this is a really simple concept, but it's really important for you to remember. You might even want to write this one down. Uh, What you feed grows and what you starve dies. So instead of nurturing a marriage to one woman, David instead chose to feed Lust, And unfortunately, this is not an uncommon story among women or men. It's a pattern that leads to hell on earth. Some of us have lived it out and are living it out in more ways than one. And that's probably why when Jesus has this big crowd of people on the side of a hill one day, he wants to make sure that he addresses this issue with the kind of seriousness that it deserves and demands. So that's where we dive into the Sermon on the Mount today in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You've heard that it was said, this is Jesus talking, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to to go into hell. That seems extreme, doesn't it? I mean, let's be honest. Doesn't it sound extreme? Extreme circumstances call for extreme measures. Maybe you remember Aaron Ralston. If you don't remember him, maybe you remember the the book or the the movie uh, about his life, 127 hours. He's bouldering, climbing, hiking. He slips down into a canyon, dislodges a boulder, gets his arm pinned between the canyon wall and the boulder. And because he was going to lose his life if he didn't do it, he amputated his own arm. And he did that precisely because his life depended on it. Why does Jesus seem to think lust is like that? Why does he choose these metaphors? Why does he think lust is a life or death situation? Why does he think it's such an extreme problem? Why is Jesus so old fashioned? Is Jesus just out there to spoil our fun? Is he some sort of cosmic killjoy? Why would he be concerned about thought crime? I mean, honestly, like even if it's wrong to lust, who cares? Who cares what people are thinking about as long as they don't act on it, as long as they don't like hurt anyone, right? I could go on and on about this, but just so you know, it's not harmless. I'm kind of on the front lines with some of these issues. I hear a lot. I'm around a lot. I'm exposed to a lot. I'm in the middle of a lot of people's lives. Think of it in these terms. Uh, Lust is the demand that women and children become the supply for. Child slaves, women being trafficked. And contrary to recent propaganda, there is no such thing as ethically sourced porn. Sometimes we get too nuanced for our own good, don't we? By definition, it objectifies, enslaves, and demeans. And I could go on, but what I really want to dial in on is that lust always gives way to the law of diminishing returns. You know what I'm talking about. The more you put in, the less you get in return. And the cycle never stops. And this is most often the case with good things gone wrong. Now, there's never been a greater example of that principle than King David's son, Solomon. It just so happens that the apple didn't fall far from the tree when it came to the two of them. The way Solomon lived demonstrated the law of diminishing returns in the most vivid way, perhaps, that the world has ever seen. See, Solomon is known as both the wisest and the wealthiest man who's ever lived. In other words, he had two things going for him in such a way that he could experiment with things at a level that you and I can't even comprehend. We can't rival. He had both the mental capacity and the financial capability to pull off 
anything that he set his mind to. Like in order to really understand the magnitude of who Solomon was, uh, you would have to combine like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bob Dylan, and then you would have to make him like the president, the prime minister, and the pope all at the same time, legitimately. And if I could sum up Solomon's mentality, it would be simply this, more is better. More is better. More is better. And he didn't do anything. Study his life. He didn't do anything halfway. Everything he did, he did to the nth degree, especially when it came to sex. He had hundreds of wives, hundreds of concubines. He had exclusive sexual access to all of them whenever he wanted. In other words, he could do what he wanted, when he wanted, with whoever he wanted. He had access to the Internet long before it ever existed is what I'm trying to tell you instant access to instant gratification. So like millennia before the advent of the American sexual revolution, before Hugh Hefner, the Kinsey Institute, Margaret Sanger, internet pornography, there was Solomon living out the ideals of unhinged total sexual air quotes freedom, which means he must have lived and died as like the most happy man to ever live, right? The most fulfilled person to ever walk the face of the earth, right? There was no fantasy denied him, no experience he couldn't enjoy. Yet, at the end of his life, look at what he says. I learned firsthand that pursuing all this, all this more is better stuff, is like chasing the wind. You ever chase the wind? Did you catch it? You did not. It's meaningless and fruitless, and it'll leave you empty every time. And that's the metaphor Solomon uses to describe his life. He took a good thing called sexual desire and he threw off all restraints surrounding it, all boundaries, only to discover that it would not deliver and could not deliver what he was ultimately searching for, which was what precisely? Well, Solomon said this again about God. He says, God, he has planted eternity in the human heart. Translation, you and I have a deep longing in our soul. We have a heart ache, literally. We are predisposed to have an eternal desire. And what we inevitably do is we try to satisfy that eternal desire with temporary things, temporary solutions. Again, sexual desire is a good thing, but when you turn it into an ultimate thing, it becomes a destructive thing. And that's true of all good things. If you make a good thing into an ultimate thing, it will become a destructive thing. Think about your life. I'll give you a hundred examples of good things that make terrible God things. Your wife, your husband, your kids, your money, your job, your hobbies, your church attendance, your athleticism, your intelligence, all good things, not ultimate things. If you make those things ultimate, that's called idolatry. And idolatry always leads to disappointment, despair, and death, always. So maybe it would help for us to define our terms. What, we, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about lust? Well, lust is the process of feeding and nurturing, this is a key word, misplaced sexual desires, which can take the form of all kinds of different things, right? Of course, internet pornography is an obvious one, but hey, what about reconnecting with someone you once had a sexual relationship with on social media? even though he's married to someone else now, and so are you, those direct messages, if someone were to read them, they might look innocent enough, but you know better. Like if you're honest, you've been playing those old tapes in your mind and you know that he probably is as well. I mean, 50 Shades of Grey was nothing new. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember walking through the grocery store and seeing all those trashy romance novels. None of these things are neutral they reveal misplaced sexual desires. You might think that Jesus sounds old fashioned, but you can't say he's wrong unless you wanna ignore the mountain of evidence that the further we depart from God's plan and intentions for us in any part of our lives, but especially in regard to sex, the more disorder and dysfunction we experience every day. In other words, the further we depart from the simplicity, beauty, and order of God's design for sex, the more you and I experience chaos and confusion. Isn't that just simply 
true? See, just like Solomon did and David before him, he, he and we believe the lie that fulfillment can be fi- found through nurturing misplaced sexual desires. And we think unrestrained sexual expression sounds like heaven on earth, but it actually brings hell to earth. This is Mary Calderon. She was the co-founder and first president of the Sexual Information and Education Council of the United States back in the 60s, translation sex ed. That was her thing. And she had this to say. A new stage of evolution is breaking across the horizon, and the task of educators is to prepare children to step into that new world. To do this, they must pry children away from old views and values, especially from biblical and other traditional forms of sexual morality. Religious laws or rules about sex were made on the basis of ignorance. Let that sink in. Jesus was ignorant, the Bible is stupid, and Christianity is archaic. That's what she's saying. Now, here's the question. Is she right? Like, who's right? Is, is she right or is Jesus right? Because they, they both can't be right. <laughs> so who's right? We'll ask it this way. Whose vision of human sexuality is our culture currently moving toward? Mary Calderon's or Jesus's? Mary Calderon's. And as we move that direction, are we experiencing new levels of freedom and joy? hope and peace. I mean, as we move that direction, we should all be super happy living in the clarity of this brave new world and sexual utopia that we have, right? On the whole, on the whole, generally speaking, are we more fulfilled? Are we more joyful? Are we living more ordered lives? I don't have to give you all the stats. The answer is a clear and resounding no. The further we've distanced ourselves from Jesus and his good intentions towards us, the more we're realizing what Solomon told us thousands of years ago. We're chasing the wind. We still haven't found what we're looking for. And so we're living in this perfect storm. It's not necessarily unprecedented. It's just new expressions of an old thing. But the perfect storm that we're experiencing is is this, sexual desire plus delayed marriage. You can read the studies in the United States, uh, men and women are delaying marriage much longer than they ever have. Uh, Men are waiting until uh, their early 30s. Women are not far behind in their late 20s and getting married, which means that their sexual peak years are not being spent in monogamous marriages, having children and building a family. Generally speaking, men and women in their 20s are spending that decade nurturing lust and moving from one sexual partner to another. The equation gets worse. Sexual desire plus delayed marriage plus pornography, which is so prevalent, equals sexual disorder and dysfunction. We go on all day about this, but young girls are being exposed to pornography and taught that their value and their worth is found in being the object of men's pleasure that plays itself out in so many different forms. Young men are being conditioned to only, only be able to sexually respond to what they see on a screen and in many cases are rendered impotent and unable to respond to an actual woman physically. Now, who do you think is very happy about all this? Answer, Satan is super happy about all this because he has one clear objective, to steal and kill and destroy. And what better way to accomplish that than at the level of our sexuality? Contrast that with Jesus's intentions towards you. Jesus, contrary to Mary Calderon's belief and others, is not trying to take anything from you. He's trying to give you something. Don't take my word for it. Read John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life abundantly. That's worth reflecting on. Because we have this tendency to believe that Jesus is like the safety patrol. Do you remember them in elementary school? Hated those guys. Wore the little sash, pointing at people, blowing a whistle, you know. Like some chaperone at a dance, you're dancing too close, you're having too much fun. It's not Jesus. He's not a hall monitor. It's not what he's after. 
Eugene Peterson said it like this, the end of all Christian belief and obedience, witness and teaching, marriage and family, leisure and work is the living of everything we know about God. Life, life, and more life. This whole sex thing, which at its best is amazing, this whole intimacy thing, when we get a true taste of it, is absolutely beautiful. Hey, I got news for you. It was his idea. He came up with it. Praise God, right? His idea. So when he tells us not to settle for some counterfeit version of it, he knows what he's talking about. As the author and designer of sex, he knows how it works best. Outside of the Bible, probably my favorite quote outside of the Bible I'm a C.S. Lewis nerd. He said it this way. We are half-hearted creatures. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. In other words, Solomon's problem was not that he had so much desire. Solomon's problem was he settled for less than what his heart was designed to be fulfilled by. No good thing can fulfill the ultimate desire of your heart. Only God can. And when we try to get from anyone or anything what we can only get from God, we are destined for disappointment. And on top of that, we tend to destroy the very people that we're demanding to get our fulfillment from. See, God has some good gifts available to you, better than what our world is offering us. Marriage is a good thing. It's not an ultimate thing. Sex is a good thing. It's not an ultimate thing. Family and children are very good things. They aren't ultimate things. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say some controversial things. They shouldn't be controversial, but they are. And you don't have to invite me back. Like, I'm getting on a plane later today. It's all good, you know. I mean, it's fine. If you're here today and you're young and you're not married, please lean in. The simplicity of marriage, sex, and children is one of God's greatest gifts. And they are worth pursuing at a young age. The idea that you should delay marriage to pursue your own self-interests is silly, damaging, and not biblical. Think about what we're actually saying. Okay, parents especially, let's, let's think about what we're communicating to our children. Take some time and what? Focus on you? I don't know, does that sound anything like Jesus? Take some time to be very selfish for like a decade and then enter into the most self-sacrificial covenant thing that you can imagine on this earth and expect to get something different than two very selfish people living out selfish lives in the same house. You with me? Don't believe the lies that our culture are throwing our direction. Practice being self-sacrificial. Find another person who's practicing being self-sacrificial and both join together in a marriage as soon as possible. Have lots of sex. Have lots of babies. Does that sound like fun? It's fun. (laughs) It's fun. Let me... This isn't in my notes. So here's the thing. I, I don't come from that family. I don't come from that family. I came from a man and a woman who quit on each other and I was the only child and I was alone most of my life. And all I ever wanted was a home. That's all I've ever wanted. And so I set out to build that. And I have not done it perfectly. But I will tell you this as somebody who went on his last first date when he was 16 and has been married to the same woman since he was 20 and has a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old, and an almost 8-year-old. It's worth it. It's better. 
what God has for you is so much better than what the world is offering you. The idea, young people, that you need to find out if you're sexually compatible before you get married is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. If she has these parts and you have these parts, you are compatible. I know we don't live in an age where, I know we want to say science is king of everything, but hey, you know, gender, fluid, all that, you know. Listen, you, you want to know how you become sexually compatible? Get together in a covenant relationship bound by God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stand before Him and stand before your family and your friends and promise till death do us part in sickness and in health and then practice that compatibility thing a lot. You get a lot better at it. You do. This idea that this like constant exchange of sexual partners in your 20s is like people just having all this just great sex all the time. Mm -mm. No, it's not. Again, the science actually bears this out if you read the studies. If you're married and there's been infidelity or you're struggling sexually, someone's addicted to porn, someone's withholding sex from the other, if intimacy on every level is missing, the way to get better is not by escaping marriage because here's the reality. Wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are. So let me say it this way. When my wife and I moved from Colorado, my, my kids, um, it was about four years ago now, we, we got a fixer upper. And not only did the inside need fixing up, but the outside needed fixing up. The, the outside, it's about seven acres, had just been overgrown by this invasive uh, plant. It's a wild honeysuckle type plant, and it just wraps itself around other trees and chokes the life out of them. And so I spent uh, the first two years that we were back in Kentucky uh, with chainsaws and machetes and axes and just getting poison ivy all over me all the time and just going to war and doing battle with all of this invasive species because I, I knew that if I didn't do something drastic and invest most of my time and energy and effort into that, it was just going to be a lost cause. Now that I'm ahead of the game and I've won the battle, every now and then these, these little sprouts come up and what I do is I go kill them immediately. I go deal with them immediately. And not because it's going to like be such a big deal tomorrow, but I know what happens if I string together a whole bunch of it won't be a big deal tomorrow type of thoughts. That's how you end up with a decade of overgrown land. Some of our marriages are that way, right? They've just been left unattended to which means that if you're in that place and it's overgrown, you're going to have to desperate measures. You're going to have to invest a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort into addressing this huge issue. But, but if, you're, if you're not in that kind of crisis mode, there may be some little things that are popping up that you're leaving unattended now that will get very big if you don't attend to them now. Don't wait. What you feed grows what you starve dies. So with that in mind, let me ask him some questions. You, you won't like these, but, if, but again, I'm heading to a jet plane. <laughs> if lust and pornography are a struggle, why do you have a smartphone? Why does the idea of getting a flip phone sound like the equivalent of gouging out an eye or cutting off a hand? Is the presence of Facebook or any form of social media in your life worth sacrificing your marriage for? If you're tempted to or have already reconnected in some intimate way with someone on the line that you're not married to, is that worth it? Is Netflix feeding your sexual desires and fueling your lust? And does canceling Netflix sound like the kind of thing that Jesus might prescribe? I mean, he did use stronger language than canceling Netflix. I mean, he said, gouge out an eye, cut off a hand. And don't confuse what I'm saying. iPhone, social media, Netflix, on their own are not necessarily bad things. The question is, what place have they taken over in your heart? And what are they feeding and fueling in your life? That's, that's the questions. See, I've dealt with countless couples who've committed adultery, countless. And in every case, 
Lust was harbored, nurtured, and secretly fed long before the physical act of adultery occurred. I've never known anyone who said, you know, just randomly one Tuesday, I ended up at a hotel with her. It doesn't work like that. I've known plenty of people who had a long-standing porn addiction no one else knew about or developed a habit of going to strip clubs or simply having overly intimate dinner conversations with a coworker on business trips. Let me tell you about my friend Jason. Jason got married to Shelly when they were really, really young, and Jason had tons of secrets and a lot of shame, and Shelly had a lot of insecurity and a lot of shame, and that combination, the enemy capitalized on it and had a field day. Jesus, J- Jason thought getting married would cure it, he thought all the temptation and struggle and lust and all that would just simply go away, and it didn't. It wasn't long before his addiction to pornography grew into a series of acts of adultery until one day Jason got caught and Shelly found out and when you hear him talk about it you can sense to this day many years later how raw the emotion still is it was a brutal day but it was a good day because any time you step out of the darkness into the light is a good day maybe a brutal day but it's a good one The day you decide to stop living in fear, shame, and insecurity is a good day. The day you decide to stop feeding the very thing that's killing you from the inside out is a good day. The day you decide to put your hope and your trust, not in how another person will respond to you, but in how Jesus will respond to you is a good day. The day that you decide to approach the throne of grace with confidence that you'll receive mercy and grace in your time of need is a good day. Jason and Shelley, they oversee a ministry to this day that's called redemptive living. I want you to write that down because if you don't need it, you know someone who does. Jason's actually an elder at Flatiron Church out in Colorado. He's a good friend of mine. I've had him speak both at Flatiron Church and at Southland uh, men's conferences and different things. I I trust him. I talked to him this this week. He and his wife, Shelly, oversee this ministry and they have a great team, a great team uh, that can help. I love the name of their ministry because redemption is their story. God is taking the most dark and brutal circumstances and redeeming them for good. And that story in Jason and Shelley is just a small version of the greater story of redemption that Jesus has been telling for a long time. It's what God's always been up to. Since the very first people on the planet gave God the finger and said, you know what, we'll do it our way. God's been in the business of taking broken people and broken circumstances and making them whole. I'm looking forward to a vacation next month. I'm a beach guy. And whenever I'm at the beach, I just sit there and stare at the ocean and watch my kids play and look at my wife. And Psalm 1611 comes up in my heart and in my mind over and over and over again. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Jesus is not hiding his intentions towards you. He has joy in mind for you. And if you ever doubt it, all you have to do is remember that on a day in history, he went to a cross for your redemption and for mine. And he had your deepest secrets and your deepest shame on his mind and in his heart and physically on his body on that cross. He became sin who knew no sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to pray for us now, and then I'll lead us in a time of communion. Father God, we come before you right now, and Father, we have departed um, so significantly from your plan for us. Father, we've walked away so many times, over and over and over again, and every time, Father, the consequences of our sinful choices come down hard, not only on us, but on those we love, those we care about. A lot of unintended consequences, Father. So, Father, we have this tendency to keep a lot of secrets, the very, the very things that you sent your son Jesus to die for. And so, Father, I pray for folks today to have the courage to come clean, to be honest, to take a deep breath, count to three, and say, there's something I need to tell you to seek someone out here at this church, 
pastor's staff say, I need some help. Some folks will jump on that website, Redemptive Living, and really see. Really see if redemption is what you're up to, not just in the world, but in each of our homes. God, thank you for how you've redeemed my life and my story, and you continue to do that. Thank you for Mosaic Christian Church. It's an honor to be here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are interested in baptism, head to mosaicchristian.org slash connect right now. Check that baptism box and we will reach out to you this week to have a conversation about what it means to put your faith in Christ and follow him.